It's a childhood disease associated with poverty and it kills about half a billion people around the world every year. Rheumatic heart disease has been wiped out in all developed nations except Australia. In fact, it's thriving in Indigenous communities here where rates are amongst the worst in the world. But as Letitia Lemke reports, a new program is helping to detect and treat the disease earlier and therefore save lives. It's an entirely preventable disease and we know it's preventable because it has been prevented in the vast majority of Australians. OK, here we go. Give them a cheer. Give them a cheer. These children might look the picture of health, but unknowingly, many of them are harbouring a potentially deadly bacteria. The streptococcal A bacteria causes acute rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease. Early symptoms are easy to miss. Sore joints, a sore throat and skin infections. But the long-term effects are unmistakable. Rheumatic heart disease causes scarring of the heart valves and leaking of the heart valves and eventually um, blocking, of, uh, blocking up of heart valves. That occurs in young adulthood. And uh, so that the, you can, uh, children can die in childhood or uh, adolescence or young adulthood. Poor quality housing and overcrowding are major factors in the spread of the disease. A lack of housing in remote communities means on average there are seven people per bedroom. On top of that, many homes don't have adequate washing facilities, kitchens or an operational toilet. It actually doesn't look too good in a country as wealthy as Australia to have rates that are equal to the worst rates anywhere in the world. Researchers are finding out just how many Indigenous children have rheumatic heart disease. They're screening at schools throughout the Territory, trying to pick up early signs of the disease. Well, we're looking at the children for rheumatic heart disease. Can you see that picture of your heart? And they're the four chambers in your heart. With the ultrasound, we can um, pick up if the valves have any abnormalities and if they're leaking. Indigenous children with rheumatic heart disease often suffer repeat attacks and on average live to just 35 years old. Identifying the disease early means children can be placed on a treatment program to reduce further heart damage. OK, come Tristan, we'll, do, we'll have a listen to your heart. Jump up on the bed for me. Tristan is one of the children to get involved in the program, but of the 300 students at the school, the clinic has only been able to access about 100. Because a lot of people are scared that we're part of the intervention. You're very good at this, you're doing really well. But at the same time, we've had a really good response. And I think um, it's such a good program and we know, they know that what we're trying to do is check the children's hearts to make sure they're healthy. And if we find any problems, then we'll, we'll treat them. Each person, depending on the severity of their rheumatic heart, condition, they will have a um, preventative bicillin in antibiotic injection once a month. My name is Gloria Friday and um, I have a grandson who's eight years old and he was diagnosed with um, rheumatic three years ago. Gloria Friday closely monitors her grandson's illness and encourages other people in the community to do the same with their children. She says it's a constant struggle convincing her grandson to attend clinics for the painful injections that he desperately needs. Sometimes he says no, so we tell him that's important for your life. You're only young, you know, so we want you to have your medication. It's not a unique story. There are probably about oh, 40 individuals in, in Borulula who have rheumatic heart disease and of course that affects almost all of the, the families. Just going to sew an artificial valve into that, into that area, basically. Ultimately, this surgery is the only solution for many people with untreated rheumatic heart disease. Operations like this aren't available in the Territory, so patients have to travel to hospitals in Melbourne and Adelaide, and it's expensive. Funding this kind of surgery costs government between five and ten million dollars a year. The cost of a control program is less than half a million dollars a year. So there's no doubt that Rheumatic fever control is not just cost effective, it costs saving. 
Jonathan Karapetis from Menzies School of Health has been pushing the early detection and prevention program in Australia for more than a decade, but says it's only now starting to gain momentum. 20 million people worldwide suffer from the disease and the program's already running successfully in some countries overseas. We've started a global program of rheumatic heart disease control, which is trying to replicate what we're doing in the Pacific, in, initially in Africa. So we have a collaboration in about four or five countries in Africa where there's some fantastic work getting started and we're looking for, for funding for it. Queensland-based researcher Michael Good is also working towards a global solution in the form of a vaccine. The first human trials will start next year and there are hopes a product could be available by 2018. Vaccines ultimately are the most cost-effective ways to improve public health. The vaccine we're talking about right now is a fairly simple uh, construction. It can, consists of, of a currently used vaccine against a different organism to which we've coupled on to that a, a, a peptide or a small protein from the streptococcus organism. So it's a fairly simple design and, and I think it'll be a fairly cheap vaccine if it's successful. But for many of Australia's Indigenous children, that vaccine will come too late. They're already infected and condemned to a lifetime of treatment. Some parents, kids who have suffered with rheumatic, you know, bring their kids along and, you know, look after their kids because our kids are the future of Borolula, you know, young people like that. Under 15 boys and girls, you need to make your way to the 100 metre start. Letitia Lemke with that report. Under the national school curriculum, science is taught for about 45 minutes a week. But one Darwin school argues that's just not enough. The Yessington School is changing the way science is taught with the aim of making the subject more relevant to a new generation. Chris Glassick joined a group of Essington students who recently put down their textbooks in favour of a hands-on science experience. 